Um, so DJI has been building these, these uh, consumer drones that are really easy to, to fly, relatively cheap to buy, and this, that allow you to do these sort of spectacular aerial uh, photos and videos. And then a somewhat different application, which is from the spin-off company that I mentioned, is sort of using these drones in an entertainment context. And what you see here is a still from a stage performance where you have a human actor performing a sort of uh, a dramatic piece with a set of quadcopters that are flying. And these now sort of add an additional layer of special effects, if you like, uh, to a stage performance. And in each of these examples, I think it's a relatively simple argument that the value of these vehicles really lies in their autonomy. So clearly DJI wants to sell you something that you can easily fly. Uh, on stage, you don't want to have 10 trained pilots and the delivery drones need to operate at a large scale, so you cannot fly them by hand. So really what we want is we want these things to be autonomous. So what I want to talk about today is two specific aspects. So first of all, I want to talk about a trajectory generation algorithm for multi-copters, uh, and secondly, about rotating vehicles and some interesting dynamics that appear if you consider these rotating vehicles. And both of these, though they're quite uh, different in what they achieve, are going to be focused on sort of a similar part of the dynamics equations. Um, so first, I want to talk about this trajectory generation algorithm here. The goal is to generate fast trajectories. So fast both in the sense of the motion that we can achieve and in the time that it takes us to compute these trajectories. So the problem is to move a vehicle from some initial state uh, to a final state in a given amount of time. So these states include the position, the velocity, and the orientation of the vehicle. And the goal is really to exploit the dynamics to make these fast trajectories. So first, I want to just introduce you to the dynamics uh, of this, this vehicle. So quadcopter, as the name suggests, has the four propellers. They're typically arranged in a rotationally symmetric fashion about the vehicle center of mass. You have two left-handed propellers that spin in one sense, and then you have two right-handed propellers that spin in the opposite sense. Each of these propellers produces a thrust force and a sort of intrinsic torque. And this torque is because as the propeller rotates, it's giving angular momentum to the air that passes through this, and this sort of creates this reaction on the vehicle. So we can write down Newton's law, which describes the acceleration of the vehicle. So the acceleration is a function of the vehicle mass, the orientation of the vehicle expressed as a rotation matrix R, the four motor forces, and then the, the, the weight of the vehicle, gravity. The rotation evolves according to this differential equation here, where PQ and R are three components of the vehicle's angular velocity. So the roll rate around X, the pitch rate Q around Y, and then the yaw rate R around the thrust axis Z. Then we can collect these three into a, a, a vector, the vector of angular velocity, and we can use Euler's law to compute the rate of change of the vehicle's angular velocity. So what we see here is the mass moment of inertia of the vehicle. And this equals the rate of change of the momentum of the propellers. Then we have a cross-coupling term, the famous omega cross I omega. This comes from the fact that we're taking a time derivative in a non-inertial frame. So the time derivative is attached to the vehicle of the body, uh, which is rotating and therefore not inertial. And we have the torques that act on the body. And these torques are the propeller forces acting at a distance from the center of mass, which is this term here. Then the intrinsic torque, this aerodynamic torque of the propellers, and then other torques that might act on the body, sort of disturbance torques. And with these equations, we can very precisely describe the motion uh, of this vehicle. Now, if you want to generate trajectories, this equation here is our biggest problem, because as you can see from, from this term, it's quite nonlinear. So it's, a, it's a, quite an ugly equation to deal with. So what we do is we throw that equation away. And the reason we're going to get away with this is because the vehicles can produce extremely large angular accelerations. So we mount the propellers far from the center of mass, which means we can produce large torques, uh, but they have relatively small uh, mass moments of inertia. So we can produce extremely large angular accelerations, which means that we can create an inner loop controller which will track the angular velocity commands. And the bandwidth of this inner loop controller can be high enough that from the trajectory generation standpoint, uh, you can treat these as inputs. And then you end up with a much simpler system where you still have four inputs, but these four inputs are now the three components of angular velocity, P, Q, and R and the total mass normalized thrust, which I'm calling C here. So we will now use this set of equations to plan uh, the quadrocopter's motion. The way we will plan these trajectories is in a two-step approach. Uh, so we will... Uh, sorry, so, so this term, this inertia will be large compared to IP, and 
near hover, this sort of thing is typically a second order equation. Uh, it's clearly second order in omega. Uh, IB is big compared to IP. So the, the body is large compared to the propellers. Sorry, this notation. So this is the mass, uh, the angular momentum change of the propellers, the angular momentum change of the vehicle. And then this is the cross coupling, which is quadratic in omega. I, th I think I am being recorded. Maybe, maybe we can discuss. We can discuss afterwards. Um, so we'll do this in a two-step approach, where we'll first generate uh, an open-loop motion where we neglect any constraints on the vehicle, uh, and then secondly, we will verify whether this motion is feasible or not. And then we'll get to do this fast enough that this sort of approach becomes useful. And this is quite different from what you typically do with, with MPC, where you encode the constraints in the generation approach. So that's sort of the difference uh, in what I'm doing here compared to a traditional uh, linear convex constrained MPC problem. So the way we will plan this trajectory is we will cheat yet again. So instead of planning in those somewhat simplified coordinates, we will plan in the trajectory's jerk, so the third derivative of position, position, velocity, acceleration, jerk. We can do this because the motion, uh, the dynamics of the quadrocopter are flat. So if I have a trajectory that's going to be thrice differentiable, I can recover the inputs, and I can recover the, the sort of inputs that would generate this motion for the quadcopter. And I'm going to generate this jerk trajectory in each spatial axis independently, and I'm going to hopefully explain how exactly this works in a second. So if I have a trajectory that is thrice differentiable, I can recover the total thrust and the angular velocity components with these relationships here. So the total thrust is a function of the acceleration, um, and two components of the angular velocity are a function of the jerk and the total thrust. And what's interesting is that the angular velocity about the yaw axis does not appear. And this kind of makes sense if you think about the way we've sort of abstracted the angular velocity dynamics uh, because the vehicle is now symmetric about its thrust axis. So those dynamics no longer appear. So now we need to come up with this thrice differential trajectory, and we do this by planning a very straightforward minimal energy trajectory. So we try to minimize the jerk squared integrated over this trajectory time horizon. And if we do it in this Euclidean norm squared sense, uh, it has the advantage that you can sort of sum up the individual components so I can optimize for each spatial axis independently and the result is still optimal for the coupled problem. And this cost that I'm minimizing for here is related to these inputs that I've had before with this relationship here. And it really just follows from this equation uh, that we had up here. So as I'm minimizing the norm of the jerk squared, what I'm also doing is I'm pushing down this uh, product of the inputs that I care about. And of course, for a linear system with a quadratic cost, it's really straightforward to solve what the motion looks like. So in this case, I know that the jerk is going to be a quadratic equation in time, and if I keep integrating up, the position is a fifth order polynomial in time, where these coefficients are just linear functions of the initial and final state of the vehicle. So if you give me some sort of set of constraints, I have to start here and I need to end there with defined velocities and accelerations. Uh, I really just need to plug in some numbers, multiply them out, and I can give you uh, this parameterized trajectory for the vehicle. Now the next thing, sorry. Uh, R being the yaw rate. Uh, capital R. So that, that doesn't mean rotation matrix. That's right. That's a different one than we No, that is the rotation matrix. Okay. So at, at any specific point in time, um, to, to go from there to here, you mean? No, I meant the why is it a linear problem? Yeah. So it's certainly linear in the end. That's fine. I cut it down. Okay. So, so the problem I'm solving is this triple integrator. So I'm... I'm computing a triple integrator trajectory over the time horizon where my cost is just the, the input squared. And then, so obviously that's sort of a toy problem that's really straightforward to solve, but it turns out it's very directly related to the things that I'm interested in. So, so that's sort of the, the thing we're doing. Um, okay, so these polynomials obviously do not encode whether the trajectory is going to be feasible for the vehicle. And feasibility here will mean uh, a few things. First of all, we want that the thrust that we produce along this trajectory is within an upper and a lower bound. So clearly, each propeller can produce a maximum amount of thrust. 
And because of the way the speed controllers work, uh, you need the motor to be spinning at a minimum speed uh, for the speed controller to maintain an estimate of where the rotor is. Um, so this gives you a minimum amount of thrust that you can produce as well, a positive minimum thrust. The angular velocity is typically also constrained because you have rate gyros that measure the angular velocity and these sort of have upper bounds on how uh, fast you can rotate before they saturate. So the way we will, I won't go into the mathematical details, I want to sort of just give you a, a feeling for it with this little cartoon down here, how we then test very quickly for feasibility of such a, a trajectory. So imagine that this trajectory goes from time zero to time capital T. The true thrust trajectory is this dotted line that you see there. This must lie between the two blue lines, F max and F min, for it to be feasible. But what we do not want to do is we do not want to simply evaluate this at many different times because that's computation expensive. So what we do instead is if we compute uh, conservative bounds for the maximum and the minimum amount of thrust that we will need, which we can compute by evaluating a few derivatives of the previous equations. And these might give us the two green lines. So if I compute it for the entire trajectory, I cannot say that it is feasible because clearly the green lines are infeasible. So what I do is I subdivide this trajectory into two parts and then I apply it to each subsection. And in this way, these bounds become more and more precise until eventually, hopefully, I can say with confidence that the entire segment is going to be feasible. And all I needed to do was evaluate this trajectory at a handful of points. Right? So that's the key. And this makes it extremely fast to evaluate feasibility. There's similar tests for the angular velocity as well. And in this way, we can now compute a motion and test it for feasibility in approximately one microsecond on a standard laptop PC like this. But it's not just, it's not just the thrust that you're doing the time. It's your, all of your variables. It's the thrust, the angular velocity, and the position. So, right, so the, the state constraints that we can encode is any box constraint. So, for example, you can constrain that the position does not fly into the floor, into the ceiling, into walls. You can put box constraints on the velocity or on the acceleration. And on the acceleration, it sort of has the interpretation of roll and pitch constraints. So you, you can encode those. Um, and then you can test for those in the sort of one microsecond on your laptop. So this is, and this is tested with respect to that simplified model. Uh, this is, so the simplified model is still correct. So if my concern is, are the angular velocities within the norm ball that my uh, rate gyros can measure? With the simplified, with these tests, I can say that with certainty. The simplified model is not relevant here. So for the tests... The simplified model generated those polynomials. Yes. So the, the only thing that that means is that the, the trajectory is optimal with respect to this jerk motion and not necessarily with respect to the original inputs because the jerk is much easier to solve for. But the constraints will be with respect to the angular velocity, like the true angular velocity of the vehicle and the true thrust that we produce along this trajectory. So the constraints are with respect to the complete model. Okay, so that's sort of the way we can compute these trajectories in on the order of one microsecond. And then you know, how do we use this, especially in, in feedback? Um, so the, the toy problem that we came up with that really requires the speed and gives you some flexibility where you can use this is to attach a, a, a racket to a quadcopter and then have the quadcopter hit the ball towards the target. And this is nice because it's a very real-time problem. Every time you throw the ball, you're going to do it differently. So you can't pre-plan these motions. You really have to generate them online. Secondly, it has a lot of flexibility. So there's many different ways you can hit the ball towards the target, which means that you can really use the speed of the search to search over a large search space. So the way you use this is we run a controller, a high-level controller at 50 hertz, so 20 millisecond sampling time. And in each of these samples, what we do is we're going to evaluate 10,000 different motions that would strike the ball towards the target. Of these 10,000, we will reject the ones that are infeasible with respect to the inputs, the one that would hit the floor or the walls, etc. And we would keep the one that is the least aggressive in the sense of the jerk squared. Of this, we apply 20 milliseconds. 20 milliseconds later, we have more information about where everything is, and we can rerun this entire algorithm. So it's very much like MPC. So what does it look like? So here in real time, okay, so I'm not sure why this is. So I, let's see. No, no, it's me. Uh, there you go. Sorry about that. The aspect ratio was wrong. So you see me throwing the ball and then the quadcopter hits it back. So this just gives you an idea of, in real time, what's the, the, the time we have for this 
this problem. So the machine, so I'll, I'll show that to you in this cartoon here. So as the ball is flying, we're measuring where the ball is and where the machine is. Then we're using this... this How do you measure? That's my key question. Okay, so we have a motion capture system. Oh. So we have cameras on the ceiling that, that measure everything. So we, we're completely cheating on the state estimations here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, so. No, but So I think it's a really interesting problem. How do we do this away from the motion capture? But uh, here, we are certainly using the motion capture. And part of the reason is this problem is already difficult with the precision of the motion capture. Because you have so little time, there's very little uh, time to react to new uh, sensor information. So on this cartoon, you'll see sort of a time slice. So the ball is not going to move, but you see the prediction of the ball moving. And then you'll see five different motions that could potentially intercept the ball and return it back to where it came from. So you can imagine if I want to hit the ball early on, I need to accelerate much quicker than if I want to hit the ball later on. I'm going to let it run one more time. So you can imagine this one is probably unfeasible with respect to thrust. These ones are probably feasible. And the one in red was the optimal trajectory that we had along this, this time instant. You can also search over how high you want to hit the ball on its way back towards the target. So here, they'll all intercept the ball at the same time, but through different return heights. So clearly, in real time, we're not actually computing each of these time instances. We're using these um, feasibility tests, et cetera, to quickly tell whether these are, are going to be feasible or not. What you see here is sort of 10% of all the trajectories that we evaluated, just to give you some idea of how densely we can search over the search space uh, of how to hit the ball back. What is that it's just uh, we're sampling along three different axes. And because we're fast enough, we can do that here. Yeah. Uh, no, grid search. Very naive grid search. Uh, but we can get, so we can evaluate approximately 10,000, which means we have sufficient resolution in this search uh, to do. No, it's not with the iOmega term. So if you're interested in what the specific motor forces are that you require along this, the individual motor forces, this does not look at that. This looks only at the total, the sum of the motor forces, and the angular velocity. So we're, we're ignoring that. That's being taken care of by this high bandwidth inner controller um, that does that. So this is run on a standard desktop i7 something, I think. Uh, it's off board. It's offline. So on the, the normal computer single core, it's one microsecond. On the Cortex-M4 that we have on here, it's about 160 microseconds per trajectory. So it's 160 microseconds if you were to run it on the microcontroller. Yes? Uh, what is the bandwidth of the high bandwidth controller? The frequency, so it's running at, at 1,000 hertz. So the onboard controller is running at 1,000 hertz. The offboard is running at 50 hertz. I want to say the bandwidth was 30 radians per second that we were running on the, the inner uh, stiff controller. So here is what it looks like when we now use it in feedback control. So what you're going to see is simply the optimal trajectory that we computed. And at each time slice, the quadcopter is effectively just executing the first 20 milliseconds of that motion. And it shows quite nicely how we can use the updated information about where the quadcopter is and where the ball is uh, to replan this motion. So you can see the predicted return path is sort of updated as we get uh, closer to impact and we have better information about how the ball is flying. Okay, so that's sort of the first part. Now I want to talk a bit about uh, what happens if you allow these vehicles to rotate. And this will talk much more about the, the mass moment of inertia. Um, so. You know, Amazon is telling us pretty soon these things are going to be everywhere. They're going to deliver our packages. Now, clearly, this comes with danger as well. So one concern is what, what happens with these vehicles when the unexpected occurs, when there is a failure, when, when someone shoots you. And one typical engineering approach to dealing with this is to add redundancy. So, you know, the, the quadcopter is simple, it's cheap. Uh, but if you add more propellers, 6, 8, or in this case, 16, uh, 
the failure of any individual part matters less to the total system. That's sort of the thinking. But of course it comes at a cost. So you can ask yourself, is there an alternative? Can I use fewer components? Fewer components, obviously it's cheaper if I have fewer components, um, at least to first order. Uh, you use less structure. I mean, every additional motor you add, you need to attach to the body. And somewhat counterintuitively, there's a lower probability of a failure occurring. So clearly, the, as they say in aviation, the safest engine you can have is the one that's not on your airplane, because it can't fail. Um, so if I can have fewer propellers, the, the probability of any one of them failing is, is lower. And I'm going to argue that you can hover a multi-copter, multi-copter with as few as one propeller. So intuitively, what's the problem? If I have a quadcopter, I have the four motor forces that I can produce. I can remap this to a three-dimensional torque vector and a total thrust. And specifically for any given total thrust, within reason, I can make the torques balance to zero. Right? So I can produce the weight of the vehicle upwards and have zero resultant torque. If I remove one of the propellers, this is no longer true. So clearly, if I want to create the weight of the vehicle in total thrust, something is going to be unbalanced. Some torque component is going to be unbalanced. So this means I cannot hover in the traditional sense. But the key idea will be to let the vehicle rotate. And if I let the vehicle rotate, I'll be able to hover these vehicles as well. So the modeling here is going to be exactly the same as we had for the quadcopter. The only difference is that we allow the propellers to be sort of spaced arbitrarily around the center of mass. They can also be rotating in any direction. That's no longer so important. Um, this is exactly as we had before, but now what might be slightly more important is this, this torque tau d, which is sort of the drag torque. So if you imagine this vehicle rotating, there's some damping acting on it to prevent it rotating infinitely fast. So I said you can hover with one propeller. Of course, implicit in that is my definition of hover, which I now want to share with you. So when I say hover, I mean the vehicle is approximately standing still. Right? So if I'm standing on the ground, it's approximately, on average, it's not accelerating away. And from the vehicle's perspective, everything is constant. So the vehicle is really seeing constant state uh, while it's hovering. Now I can put this into my dynamics equation. I can average out the acceleration, and I can set the angular velocity derivative, the angular acceleration, to zero. And I get these two constraints. And if I play with these constraints a bit, I get the following properties for any of these relaxed hover solutions. So first of all, the angular ve velocity must be parallel to gravity. So either you're spinning sort of upwards or you're spinning downwards. Um, and the position trajectory will be a horizontal circle. So you can imagine this vehicle sort of tracing out a horizontal circle. But importantly, from the vehicle's perspective, it's sort of staying at a constant distance from the set point. So just to give you an idea of what these solutions might look like, if you take a quadcopter with a weight of five newtons, which is what we used in, in the lab, um, if I have four propellers, each propeller produces a quarter of the vehicle's weight, um, and you're at zero angular velocity. If I remove one of the propellers, the force I require goes up. This kind of makes sense. And I need to be rotating somewhat fast. So this is about 20 radians per second. Um, but if I'm at this state, I'm at an equilibrium. So the vehicle will stay there. If I remove a second propeller, the motor forces go up again. And the angular velocity goes up slightly again. And these are equilibria for this, this system. Now, of course, an equilibrium is, is only the first part of the problem. The next question is, can I enter this equilibrium and can I maintain it in the face of disturbances? And I'm going to look at you know, this specific kind of vehicle that has two propellers. The reason is the mass sort of comes out most nicely, but the analysis is very similar for any rotating vehicle uh, that you'd like to look at. I'm also only going to look at attitude control. So I'm going to argue that if I can control where the thrust vector is pointing, I can control where the, pos the, the position of this vehicle by controlling the acceleration. So I'm going to limit this analysis to the, the attitude of the vehicle. And the key idea, so the problem, intuitive difficulty with controlling this is I have two inputs, so two forces that I can produce. Um, these two propellers will create a torque around the thrust axis because of the reaction torques being parallel. I can create a torque around this axis with the difference of the two forces, but I can create no torque around the axis that connects the two motors. So there's no way for me to directly actuate this orientation here. So the way to still control this vehicle is to exploit this omega cross i omega term. And specifically what I'll do is I'll have the vehicle rotate very quickly around its thrust axis, and then I'll induce an angular velocity with the torque that I can directly actuate. 
And then these two will interact through omega cross I omega to create an angular acceleration around this third axis that I cannot act with. So if I want to write this down as an LTI system, I can create a four state system. The four states that I need to introduce are two components of the angular velocity, so the roll rate and the pitch rate, and two components of the orientation of the vehicle. Um, so this is two components of a unit vector that describe the thrust. You can also think of them as the roll and pitch angle up to a sign and a permutation. Um, and I will linearize with the input being the difference between the two forces. So this is clearly proportional to the torque that I'm producing around that axis. And then I get this rather nice to me uh, LTI system where the dynamics matrix is quite sparse and it has sort of only two interesting numbers. R bar is the steady state yaw rate, so how quickly this vehicle is rotating about its thrust axis. A bar is this uh, mass moment of inertia coupling constant, which is a function of the vehicle's mass moment of inertia, the speed at which the vehicle is rotating, the propeller's mass moment of inertia, and the speed at which the propellers are rotating. Um, but once I have the system in this form, I can use all of my favorite LTI tools to analyze it and to control it. So specifically, what we did in the experiments that will follow is we designed an LQR controller based on this. But you can also sort of look at this and ask yourself, under which conditions will this vehicle be controllable? And it turns out that there are two interesting cases where such a vehicle is not controllable. The exact conditions are written down here, but if you make a, a simplifying assumption, it's slightly more intuitive. So if you assume that the propellers have negligible mass, so the propellers are very small compared to the body, then these two conditions are if the mass moment of inertia is similar to that of a sphere, so if the vehicle has symmetric uh, mass moment of inertia, it will be uncontrollable. Um, and the reason is that this coupling here will disappear. Alternatively, and more surprisingly to me at least, was if the vehicle is flat, so if it's a two-dimensional object, um, then it's also uncontrollable. Which means that if you're designing a quadcopter and you might want to control it in this fashion, you want to sort of push your mass moment of inertia away from these two extremes. So you want to sort of somewhere in the happy medium uh, to be able to control. Okay, so what is this good for? One thing this is good for is as a fail-safe algorithm for quadcopter. So you'll see here, this quadcopter is going to take off. You can ignore this one, it's just filming. So it's going to take off. And this is an onboard view looking out to the right-hand side of the You notice that there's a nut missing here, so this propeller should be held down with the nut, uh, which means it's going to vibrate this. <laughs> But you can see it happens is the vehicle sort of, once the propeller fails, obviously it tips over because of the torque imbalance. It detects the failure and it starts to build up this angular momentum and then recovers. So here's sort of a slow motion of the same thing. This is the propeller that's going to fail. You see the vehicle pitch over and then it starts to build this angular momentum. And once it has sufficient angular momentum, it can use this control strategy to bring itself back to its original position. So specifically what we had implemented here was it detected uh, an angular acceleration that was not consistent with the th motor forces it was producing and the total thrust that was measuring through the accelerometer was not consistent with the motor forces it was producing. Now in this specific video we were cheating because we knew which one would fail so we just needed to detect the failure that we knew was going to happen but that's specifically what we used. Ideally what you want to use is you want to use the current that the motor controller is drawing, because this very directly tells you the torque that you're producing, and if there's a problem, then that will be the clearest signal. Now, you can use it as a failsafe, but you can also use it to create new kinds of vehicles. So this is what a typical quadcopter looks like, and then we created sort of a variety of vehicles that each has successively fewer propellers than the last. I'm quickly going to talk about the one with two propellers and the one with one propeller, because these have sort of interesting dynamic properties. So the two-propeller vehicle we called the bi-spinner, and as you can sort of tell, I guess, it's simply a quadcopter where we sawed off two of the arms. We then, you know, plugged the numbers in, we computed the controller, we put it in the experiment, um, and we flew. And as you can see, it flies. Um, you can control its position, it can hover, uh, you can do a soft landing. Um, but in our experiments, it was an extremely difficult vehicle to fly. I want to show you what I mean by that. I sort of had this extreme instability that would sometimes appear and cause the vehicle to crash. And we then went back and we tried to figure out what was going on. Why is this so much harder than a quadcopter? And it's 
mostly interesting because there's a nice take-home experiment that goes along with it. So if you take your cell phone and you try to throw your cell phone, uh, there's three, yeah, use someone else's cell phone, ideally. <laughs> uh, there's three principal mass moments of inertia to any physical body. So for your cell phone, it's clear the biggest mass moment of inertia is around this axis, the smallest one is here, and then the middle one is this axis here. And no matter how hard you try, you'll never get the, the, the cell phone to do a nice rotation about the middle uh, axis of inertia. And it turns out that this is exactly what we're trying to do with this vehicle. So you can imagine the mass moment of inertia is quite different from the quadcopter, and we're now rotating around the middle axis of inertia. And it turns out that this, the linearized system has an eigenvalue out somewhere way on the unstable side. So plus 35, I'm not sure if that's quite correct, but somewhere extremely unstable, which means that the moment there was any noise that caused the actuator to saturate, this vehicle would explode um, very quickly. And here's just a graph showing this. Uh, so this is the angular velocity of the vehicle, the roll rate, the pitch rate, and the yaw rate. The roll and pitch rate should be close to zero. Uh, and then at this point, we turn off the motor force, uh, the motors. So these are the motor forces plotted over time. And you can sort of see uh, here the controller is fighting quite hard to keep the, the vehicle stable. And then we turn it off. And you see this extremely large angular acceleration uh, that occurs. And that's sort of what we saw in the experiments as well. So you sort of saw this vehicle explode in attitude. So we then used this knowledge, this insight that we had gained, and we tried to create a vehicle that has only a single moving part. And this, we believe, is the mechanically simplest controllable flying vehicle in existence. And it's mechanically simple because it has only a single moving part. It has only this one rotating propeller. So conceptually, it's a propeller tied to a brick. So there's no other aerodynamic surfaces. There's nothing else, uh, at least obviously special, about this vehicle. There's a battery, there's some electronics, there's a motor controller, and there's the motor. And we're using the same sort of control paradigm as we were using before, we, uh, exactly the same linearization strategy uh, to control the vehicle. And it turns out that you can then fly this vehicle. So here you see what it looks like when it's hovering. It rotates quite quickly. You notice that the thrust is inclined to one side. This is because we have only a single propeller, so we have to sort of point the thrust slightly inwards. Um, and you can sort of imagine the center of mass tracing out this horizontal circle that I was talking about before. So the way you might launch this vehicle is like a Frisbee. So obviously, if you wanted to start from the ground, it would fall over before it starts spinning. So if you throw it like a Frisbee, you give it this initial angular momentum that it requires to fly. So here you see a, a sort of doom view of what this might look like. Um, so you can launch it into the air. And then to prove controllability, what Wei Xuan, the student that, that did most of the work, is doing is he's using this magic wand to tell the vehicle to fly to a specific point in space. So you can see the vehicle is, is reasonably agile, given that it has only a single input to control itself. Um, now, I just want to mention, why does it have this funny shape? It's not completely arbitrary. Um, as we saw with the bi-spinner, the mass distribution is extremely important for the stability of this vehicle. So we try to make the mass distribution uh, to make our life easier. So we started off with the three massive components, the propeller, the battery, and the electronics on an equilateral triangle. And then we perturb the location of the electronics. So you can imagine you had them on an equilateral triangle, the battery and the propeller and the electronics. And then we move the electronics around. And what you see on this sort of uh, map here is the probability that for the linearized system, the input will saturate over one second of flight. And you can see that if I move the electronics inwards, this probability increases. And as I move it sort of to this sweet spot here, um, you get uh, a robust design. So on this one, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> the utility of this vehicle is up for debate, I think. Um, but I mean, potentially, you could imagine you could put a line scanner on it. And then as you're rotating, you're effectively taking panoramic photographs, right? And then this could be an extremely cheap design, because you have only the single moving part. Um, OK, so. Uh, that's the theory, that's sort of the, the, the idea. Um, this is also something that we have commercialized. So we patented this idea of, of controlling after the failure happens with this uh, cross-coupling, and we've licensed it to a commercial partner. Now, I showed you the bi-spinner, and it turns out this thing is not a complete waste of time, because if you sort of think of the bi-spinner, and you think of another bi-spinner, and you were to glue them together, what you get is a quadcopter. But it's a fully redundant quadcopter. So if each of these effectively has a backup system 
that can carry it home if something fails. So if I have one of these vehicles and anything fails on this vehicle, the battery, the microcontroller, the sensors, the propellers, it doesn't matter, you have a second vehicle that's ready to take over and fly you home. So in this way, we can build a quadcopter that's completely redundant. So it exists of two independent subsystems that can each fly the vehicle. And this is something that uh, this spin-off company, Verity Studios, has sort of run with, and they have commercialized this. And you can actually th see these vehicles in New York City if you go to um, a Broadway show by Cirque du Soleil called Paramour. And it's quite fun. I want to just show you the, the trailer so you get some of the... <laughs> Screen. He's the greatest there is. He's not a weapon. He's not a weapon. There are eight drones that fly in this show. So the show itself is about two, two hours long. The drones fly about one minute, so they're a relatively small part. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's a big show. There's lots of acrobats. There's a lot of lights. It's a huge production. Uh, it's in the largest theater on Broadway. It's 2,000 seats. Um, and you can imagine that... OK, I want to just show you what the drones look like. <laughs> Drones fly over the actors. So in this scene, just some background, this is the two characters. It's a love triangle. They fall in love. The first time they kiss, magic happens and things start to fly. Uh, and <laughs> as, you know, as this is happening, these drones are flying over the actors. No equation. <laughs> uh, so these drones are flying above the actors. There's no net separating the drones from the actors nor from the audience. So there's nothing physically separating these things. So you can imagine this is a situation where it's extremely important that you can achieve the safety you need. And especially if something were to go wrong, and for some reason you have to cancel the show, uh, you have 2,000 members of the audience that will demand their money back, which is uh, quite a substantial sum. So in this situation, this fully redundant vehicle gives you the confidence to run this day in and day out. Because any single component fails, that vehicle has a second system that can take over and fly it home. So that's sort of the, the idea here. So just before I wrap up, I want to thank a lot of people who were involved in, in what I've shown. So at the ETH, where sort of the indoor experiments were shown, um, the Flying Machine Arena, lots of different people worked on the infrastructure. And the experiments I showed you are only possible because of this excellent infrastructure that had been built up over the years. So there's the faces here, and I guess especially RAF, uh, I want to mention. Then the, the the vehicles were mostly student projects, especially Weishuan with the monospinner uh, who made this crazy vehicle fly. Then Verity Studios, the spin-off company, um, we've grown since this photo was taken. Uh, if you're interested in doing an internship or something in Zurich, you should definitely go check them out. They, they're always looking for, for good people. Uh, and it's, it's a, a fun place to be. Um, so in, in conclusion, I talked a little bit about trajectory generation, where I presented this algorithm that hides some of the complexity of the quadcopter dynamics and is enabled to very quickly generate and verify motions. And this is useful if you have a flexible problem, so where you need to search over some space. And because it's so fast, you can then do something very naive, like a, a, simply gridding the search space. And if you think this is interesting, there's some open source code that you can download. Uh, if you have questions, email me, and I'm happy to discuss it with you. Um, and you know, it's, it's useful, I think, especially if you have this search space that you want to look over. And in the end, I talked a bit about this rotating vehicles and how instead of neglecting these dynamics or treating them as a disturbance, if we really incorporate them into the controller, we can create vehicles that have quite rich dynamics and allow us to do things like fly with a single propeller. So thank you very much for your attention.
So my understanding of sort of the commercial helicopter uh, emergency is the, the auto rotation, which, which is when you when you lose power to the main rotor. And what you then do is you effectively trade your potential energy for kinetic energy in the rotor. Yeah. So you spool up the rotor by falling, yeah. and then when you're near the ground, you use this kinetic energy in the rotor to produce the thrust so that you hit the floor softly, yeah. hopefully. Um, that's somewhat different from what you're doing here because with these vehicles, you there's very little energy that you can store and you don't have the pitch control to create this thrust very quickly. So on the helicopter with the collective, you can very quickly take this kinetic energy and uh, transform it into uh, the thrust. Here, the propellers actually store a negligible amount of energy. And if you lose the ability to control the propeller, to put power in, you can't do anything else because they're fixed pitch. So in that sense, it's a bit different. So it's something we've played with a bit is, is using this motion generator as a primitive that you can then use in a higher level planning algorithm. So you can imagine if you do RRT, RRT star, for example, uh, you can use this as a primitive to generate the individual nodes uh, along the search. As long as, you know, if you're flying in a convex space, which is obviously unlikely to be very applicable, um, you can directly apply these box constraints uh, that we can evaluate very quickly. But if you have a non-convex space, then... It, right, so if you want to fly around a person, then it becomes more interesting. And then you need to sort of think about how can you uh, either approximate this or develop computationally efficient tests that allow you to retain the speed of this approach while allowing you to test for uh, in collisions with you know, non-convex obstacles. But I mean, clearly, the, the speed is amenable to things like RRT star because it's so fast. We can get useful primitives very quickly. Yes? For the um, single rotor uh, vehicle, you mentioned that you could you investigate in changing the rotor distribution in order to make it more stable. Right. Is something different for the bi-scanner? Right. So uh, for the single vehicle, we did sort of play with the design to get a more stable uh, closed loop system. But for the bi-spinner, we didn't really do it because it's not of much interest. I know if I take the bi-spinner and I add two more motors and I don't turn them on, I have the quadcopter configuration effectively. I know this is easy to control. So, you know, that, that's sort of one way you could make it easy to control. Obviously, the problem is these two motors that you're adding add a lot of mass, so you have to carry them, which costs you energy, but they don't add any useful uh, capabilities. So that's sort of the downside of that. Adjacent. So two adjacent rotors are much harder than two opposite rotors. And the reason is, for this to work, we need the vehicle to be rotating quickly around its thrust axis, and two adjacent propellers spin with opposing handedness. So effectively, what you need to do is you need to use the one propeller to produce a lot of thrust, the other one to produce very little thrust to get this motion going. And effectively, it's not much different from trying to fly a quadcopter with only a single propeller. So... Uh, Two adjacent versus having only a single propeller left are about the same. Um, if you had an infinite amount of, of uh, thrust that you could produce, you can control a quadcopter as well with a single propeller, much like the monospinner, um, or with two propellers adjacent. Uh, but you, on a real system, you very quickly run into thrust limits. So that's going to be the first thing that bites you. But you have greater uh, ability to adapt. So your, your controllability will be much, much nicer because you have an extra input, right? So that's interesting because the problem is, of course, then it's uh, you have to deal with this sort of manifold, right? Um, I have some ideas. I mean, I've played with this a bit. I haven't found something that's nice, right? I haven't found a, a, an easy solution to that. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's it's a rich problem because of the richness of the attitude dynamics, right? And the resolution generally. I found in my experience very hard to optimize. Right. So, so clearly, if you want to incorporate the omega cross i omega, it becomes even more difficult. But if you assume that I can directly uh, dictate the angular velocity 
uh, even then it's a, it's a rich problem, right? One last question. About one microsecond. On the scale, yeah. So, so what we had is we used about half of the, the sampling time to do the planning, and the other half we had for estimation. So. So one thing that certainly if you, I mean, it's the curse of dimensionality. So we were searching with a three-dimensional search space, right? So if you were to add a fourth dimension, suddenly 10,000 is not so much, right? You, you, your, your sampling becomes much coarser. So if you have a situation like that, if you have a much larger search space, then the, the speed becomes useful. Um, I can't think of any other specific thing, but uh, I think that's the key. Okay, so thank you all for your attention.